And the second is, is the fairly poor urban environment that exists in Seven Dials and around that area now. Um, I think most people agree it's a fairly tired area. It does need some improvement. And um, thirdly, moving on to walking and cycling. Um, for pedestrians in particular, um, the pedestrian routes, if you want to get from one side of the dials to the other, um, are very long and indirect, mainly because the um, existence of the barriers make you, force you to cross at certain locations and don't let people make their own decisions about where they want to cross. Um, and secondly, it is very difficult for cyclists, and I put there perceived and actual danger. Lots of cyclists tell us that Seven Dials is a barrier to them taking up cycling or cycling in that area. Um, but also, of those accidents that have happened at Seven Dials there in the last three years, almost half of them have involved a cyclist in some way or another. Um, we've heard a lot about vulnerable road users today. Obviously, cyclists are very vulnerable. Um, and any accident involving a cyclist in a vehicle tends to mean that the cyclist comes off a lot worse. Um, and also vehicles, um, car drivers and, and buses and all sorts who go through there. Are lots of vehicles that do pass through Seven Dials every day. Um, and there is a very high potential for conflict between those different vehicles. Um, and again, that's reflected in that high accident rate. Um, and there's also a great deal of uncertainty uh, caused by the layout of Seven Dials, with so many conflicting traffic movements all happening in such a small place. That does create a degree of delay, especially for those drivers who are unfamiliar with the area. So what we've got here is... is a quick video um, that was taken around a month ago which shows you the conditions at Seven Dials um, in the AM peak period. I think it's around 8.15 in the morning. It's only, it's only a minute long, but it just shows some of the conflicts or the very near misses that happen on a daily basis. I think that illustrates the delay that's caused as well. You can see the, the grey vehicle trying to edge out Goldsmith Road there. It takes quite a long time for that vehicle to actually move across the roundabout. You can see some cyclists in these shots as well. Uh, this, is, this is in real time as well. <laughs> and as I say, this, this wasn't a day that we chose because it was particularly bad. This is a typical day on the Seven Dark. Uh, there's a particularly bad one that comes up in a minute where you can see how close this cyclist, I think, approaching from the right, how quickly, how, how close they are there. And the difficulties that that does create. <coughs> So how do we think we can address uh, some of the problems at Seven Dials? Well, what, what you can see in front of you there is effectively what we consulted on. Um, the key points are, um, as we move around very, very quickly, obviously the, the main thing you'll notice that looks visually different is the central island. At the moment we have a very small central island. Um, this proposal suggests a much larger, elongated central island that effectively creates a single circulatory traffic lane um, to ensure that the traffic is controlled in that single lane rather than being two or even three abreast at times as it is now. Um, lots of space for additional um, pavement space um, to improve the pedestrian environment. Um, the current traffic lights that exist on, I think six of the arms would be proposed to be replaced by zebra crossings that would be raised um, up from the road surface so it would give you the effect of a, a speed reducing feature as well. <coughs> and those entries where there are double lanes or two lanes coming in would be reduced to single lane. So every, every arm of the junction would either be single lane entry or exit. There are two optional elements as well that were included within the consultation. Um, one related to Vernon Terrace, which was for the option to change it from this current two-way arrangement to um, single lane exit only, so no vehicles would be able to enter the roundabout via Vernon Terrace. The other one involved Bath Street, which is the road that kind of completes the triangle at the back of the roundabout. Um, that is currently one way that we consulted on the idea of converting that to two-way. So moving on to the actual consultation itself, just a very quick breakdown of what we did. Um, it was a four-week consultation period, um, which ended on the 2nd of November. That was preceded by um, an 
initial workshop session that we did, a couple of sessions on the dials and in, in the local church, we actually, before we had any ideas, we just asked people um, what they felt needed to be changed and the proposals reflected what, what people told us at that time. Um, but as part of the main consultation, we, we sent out just over 7,000 postcards to, the, to, to quite a large surrounding area. And packs were delivered to all of the businesses with, with copies of the plans as well. Um, we actually put information boards of the proposals and the consultation details on the, on the dials, which are still up there. Uh, we had four public exhibitions and a separate public meeting just to discuss the Vernon Terrace issue. Um, we had questionnaires made available at exhibitions for people to pick up as and when they came along and viewed the proposals. Um, and everything as, as standard these days was, was on the council website and within the consultation portal so people could, get, could complete the forms online. So very quickly moving on to the results, um, Council Davies already kind of alluded to what they were. But question one was the main question which was do you support proposed changes to the Seven Dials roundabout as shown in the plan that I previously showed. Um, so you can see you've got exactly two to one in favour, so 660 respondents in total, uh, 440 in favour, 220 against, so, so quite a strong majority. <coughs> that was before Vernon That was before Vernon Terrace, yeah. So we, we asked separate questions about Vernon <coughs> Terrace and Bar Street, which I'll just comment to you now, but that, that one was purely about the roundabout proposed itself, so that's the larger roundabout, the zebra crossings, the single lane entry and exits. So question two, which was about the change to Bath Street, would you want that retained as one way or changed to two way? As you can see, there's no real clear consensus either way, but there was a slight favouring of keeping that as one way. So I don't think there's a strong enough mandate for us to change that. So um, we would suggest going with keeping it as it is effectively as a one way system there. Uh, question three, which was about Vernon Terrace, did um, cause some more controversy. Um, as you can see, it was very strongly in favour of retaining it as two-way. So the southbound only option only attracted just over 20% support, whereas there was 73% favour of keeping it two-way. So just very, very quickly looking at why people said no, um, looking at the actual main roundabout proposals, we can, we can go into the results and pick out why people said no. So 89 people felt that the changes would in some way cause more congestion at the roundabout and therefore may possibly result in that running in residential roads. Uh, 74 people were concerned about the removal of the guard railings. 65 uh, had some degree of concern about the zebra crossings or getting rid of the traffic lights and replacing them with zebra crossings. Um, and 64 people were negative about the one-way burn test option. So just moving on to the main objection really, which was purely based on the capacity of the seven dials and the fact that if we were to do these cha to make these changes, it would reduce that capacity to an extent that would mean people would seek alternative routes. What we have done is carried out some quite comprehensive traffic modelling in the area using a programme called Arkley, which is industry standard, which allows us to look at the capacity of the roundabout as it is now compared to how it would be in the future. And we then that a computer simulation of those results so we can actually show you roughly what it would look like. Um, but the results basically indicate that all arms would continue to operate slightly below their theoretical maximum capacity um, and queues and queue lengths would be reduced on all of the arms of the roundabout apart from Dyke Road North where there would be a slight impact on capacity but it would still operate below its maximum theoretical capacity. So I'll show you this video now which again is it's a computer simulation so it doesn't look quite the same as the previous one but this is actually based on the new layout so it shows you how it operates and you can see it from various different views. So you can obviously see there the much bigger roundabout in the middle there itself, the central island and the way traffic would be far more controlled as it moved around. It's also, also to illustrate that the same or very similar amount of traffic can still get through the area. And so this is, this is based on actual traffic flows as recorded at the roundabout. You can actually see pedestrians crossing there as well. The, the kind of grey strip across there that you can see, and that uh, suggests that's where the zebra crossings would be. So, and that's based again on the actual number of people who are crossing at the roundabout at the moment.
So based on the results of the consultation and listening to, to residents' issues and concerns, we now have a revised scheme that was presented at the meeting on the 17th of December. Um, and this is effectively what it looks like. Visually, you'll notice that it's, it's fairly similar. We have added some trees at the suggestion of local people. It was very much felt that um, there should be some kind of greening of the, of the area. And we're actually looking at the feasibility of whether or not we can get those trees in at the moment, because there tends to be lots of underground equipment that is very expensive to move, such as you know, telecom cables and gas pipes and such like. But we very much want to do that. So looking at the revised scheme that is being proposed for, recommend, is recommended for approval today, um, Bath Street would remain one way, uh, Vernon Terrace would remain two way. Um, we're looking at, the, there's a very large tree on the corner of Vernon Terrace. Um, we are proposing to remove that tree, but that would be um, mitigated by the introduction of the additional trees. We would be aiming to get at least sort of 10 to 15 additional trees and the council, our borough culturalist, is happy with that, providing um, those additional trees would go in and would see that as, a, as an overall improvement to the area. Um, Dyke Road, there's, a, there's currently a bus stop which is located outside some shops. They, those businesses are very keen for that bus stop to be moved slightly further north um, and have loading, a recessed loading bay there instead so they can actually load to and from their premises, which gives them quite a lot of trouble at the moment. That also has the benefit of moving the, the north and southbound bus stop slightly further apart so that there is less kind of friction in that area. Um, and we've also looked to see where we might be able to get some slightly wider pavements, in particular on that corner um, of the Chatham Place there, that we've been able to get slightly more space there um, in response to concerns from some school parents of school pupils where there's quite a lot of pedestrian traffic on that corner in particular. So just very, very last couple of slides now, talking about a couple of other issues. Obviously, the removal of the guard railing has been quite a contentious issue throughout this consultation as well. We've had lots of arguments from both sides, but just, just a couple of things, really. I think when we, need to, when we look at the guard railing, we need to consider that there are both sides to the argument. Um, as you can see there, it's, it's, a, it's just a graphic, really. It, it shows you that there are two sides to it, as I said. So, lots of examples where you actually see people trapped on the wrong side of the railings and those people, once they're in that position, they actually can't get back onto the roundabout in many places because the railings are so, so restricted. Um, another example there. So once that person has made that decision to cross in that manner, they're actually committed to that for the whole rest of their journey. And the other key thing to know in terms of supporting the proposal with evidence is the Department of Transport <coughs> fairly recently issued guidance that says there is no conclusive evidence whatsoever that the inclusion of pedestrian guard railing at any type of pedestrian crossing or junction has any statistically significant effect on the safety record at that junction. Um, there are lots of negative factors to having it, so one asks if there are no real advantages of having it, um, why would we look to, to retain it in that area? Um, the other issue, zebra crossings, um, the reason for us proposing them um, in terms of replacing the traffic lights with zebra crossings is that we very much see them as an upgrade. Um, we, we feel that they will be quicker and more responsive crossing for pedestrians because it's crossing on demand. As soon as you get there, you don't have to wait for the lights to change. You get there and it's instant, it's on demand. Um, there is no evidence of a poorer safety record at zebra crossings compared to traffic lights either. And that's borne out nationally and within the city as well. Um, the other thing that, that is quite <coughs> important for some drivers is, is what we call in wasted red time, where you get very high incidences, especially on some arms, where pedestrians press the button, then can't be bothered to wait for the lights to change, cross anyway, and then the lights continue and go ahead and change to red, so drivers get held at those red lights and then there's no one crossing, which is quite frustrating for everyone. So moving forward, time scales, this is the final slide. Um, obviously, Transport Committee today, where we're seeking approval to, to press ahead with implementation of these measures. Um, the, most of the changes, or the vast majority of the changes, changes don't require traffic regulation, or there aren't very many changes to parking. <coughs> um, so if approval is granted, we'll be looking to start construction probably early, mid-March 2013 and then aim to have the scheme fully complete and implemented by the summer of 2013. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. By the, the summer, what do you mean? The start of the summer, the middle of the summer, the end of the summer? It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's difficult to, to absolutely commit at this stage, but as soon as we possibly, yeah, sure. we prefer start of the summer, certainly.
for starters, okay. So the, 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 the total phase, phase, the build phase, would be? It would be March to summer. Okay. Yeah, sometime. I mean, uh, it's difficult to say exactly at the moment, so we haven't gone into that level of detail. Sure, okay. Okay, well, well, well thanks very much. We have some lights.